Good day, this is Dr. Devart and we are going to talk about preeclampsia, severe preeclampsia and eclampsia. So the aims of this module is to be able to recognize preeclampsia, severe preeclampsia and eclampsia, to understand the disease process as much as it's possible and to <coughs> practice an effective response to it. So why is preeclampsia so important? Well, in South Africa, it's the number two direct cause of maternal mortality and the number three overall cause of maternal mortality in 2015 when this slide was made. But in the recent triennium of the National Committee for Confidential Inquiries into Maternal Deaths, it's the number two overall cause of maternal mortality in South Africa. In other words, it's important because it's common and because it can kill mothers. And 60% of the deaths were associated with substandard care. In other words, if the care had been better, these mothers might have lived. Also remember that preeclampsia is a disease of the endothelium and which organ systems contains endothelium well basically all of them and therefore it can always it's always multi-organ so let's talk about some definitions what is hypertension in pregnancy a systolic blood pressure of above 140 um, and a diastolic blood pressure of above 90 on two or more occasions Severe hypertension is a blood pressure of more than 160 over 110, and this can this is only a once-off episode. This is sufficient to diagnose hypertension. Remember that gestational hypertension and preeclampsia are diagnosed after 20 weeks. If hypertension is diagnosed before 20 weeks, we consider it to be chronic hypertension, even if it is a new diagnosis. What is the definition of preeclampsia? Preeclampsia is Hypertension after 20 weeks with one or more one or more of the following. In other words, you always need hypertension, you don't always need proteinuria. But basically, proteinuria or renal impairment, liver impairment, hematological impairment, neurological impairment, or growth restriction, fetal growth restriction. The range of the organs affected are not limited and are as a result of endothelial dysfunction. And, and it's, it's not um, sort of a sequence of events. So it's not that you first get preeclampsia and then you can get Haub syndrome and then you can get eclampsia. You can get any organ dysfunction at sort of any point. You don't even necessarily need severe hypertension you can have mildly elevated blood pressure and eclampsia, for instance, or mildly elevated blood pressure, 140-90s, and help syndrome. So it's important to understand that. And don't feel reassured just because the blood pressure isn't maybe that high, that the patient won't have organ system dysfunction. So why is preeclampsia so dangerous? Well, because the extent of the disease is usually underestimated, not only by the patients, but also by the healthcare provider. You tell the patient, oh ma'am, it looks like you've got preeclampsia, your blood pressure is 140, 90, you've got two plus proteinuria, we have to admit you to the hospital. And what will the patient tell you? But doctor, I'm feeling fine. I'm not feeling sick. I don't have a headache. This also means that patients don't present early enough because they feel fine. This is why we need antenatal care. This is why with every antenatal visit, we always screen for preeclampsia. We always check the blood pressure. We always test the urine because it's very often asymptomatic. Um, so what are the principles of management? Stabilize the mother. Okay, that's the principle. Deliver the fetus. Don't get confused with what we do at tertiary hospitals with expectant management. The principle is to stabilize the mother, mother, deliver the fetus. Treat and prevent fits. Always treat dangerously raised blood pressure. 
Why? Because this can also kill mothers or cause strokes or cerebrovascular accidents. Careful attention to fluid balance. It can be very tricky. And be aware and prevent complications. So, what is stabilization? Start with hello ma'am, check the alertness and assess CAB. Circulation, airway breathing, administer magnesium sulfate to prevent or treat fits, control the blood pressure, look at the blood results, assess the output and intake. So, immediate assessment, shake and shout, hello ma'am, call a cab, look at the position of the patient, support the circulation, airway and breathing, obtain IV access, give magnesium sulfate and then assess the organ systems. Big five, forgotten four, call one. So in ESMO, this is how they divide organ systems. This is a quick way of assessing the patient. They want to try and basically make it easy for you to remember in an emergency situation. What is the big five? Central nervous system, cardiovascular system, respiratory system, gastrointestinal and renal, that's the big five, forgotten four, hematological, immunological, endocrine, musculoskeletal, and then core, uterus and the fetus. So, how do we manage preeclampsia? If the blood pressure is more than 140, 90, and there's more than one plus proteinuria, so in other words, if you suspect preeclampsia, the patient must always be admitted. There's no place for outpatient management of preeclampsia. So if they're phoning from a community health care centre, or MOU or a bank clinic, advise them to stabilise the patient, treat the blood pressure, give magnesium sulphate and transfer the patient. Evaluate the systems, pick five, forgotten four, call one, and assess for delivery depending on the viability of the fetus and the facility that you are in. So, how do we treat hypertension only? If the blood pressure is more than 140 over 90, but less than 160 over 110. So, if it's more than 160 over 110, you need to admit the patient. Because this is a dangerous blood pressure range and patients can suffer from strokes or cerebral vascular accidents. So, if, if it's in between that range, you start the patient on alpha methyl dopa. And you need to follow them up in three days to check the blood pressure and the urine. Not in two weeks, three days. Because this could be the very first sign that the patient is in fact developing preeclampsia. If at the follow-up the blood pressure is still raised or there's proteinuria, then she needs to be referred for admission. If the patient has severe preeclampsia, a blood pressure of more than 16110, severe proteinuria, or she's symptomatic, then you need to admit the patient always. Admit, stabilize. So how do you stabilize the patient? Call a cab. So call for help, circulation, airway breathing. Then you need to give magnesium sulfate to treat and prevent convulsions. Then you need to treat the hypertension then you assess the organ systems, then the urine, the intake and the output, and then only do we assess the fetus. Now, so remember, don't put the CTG on as soon as the patient lies on the bed. First, make sure that the patient is stable and that you have a diagnosis. Then you assess the fetus and deliver or refer for expectant management. So, now we're going to watch, I want you to watch the video um, of the eclamptic patient that is on the website and then we will continue with the second part of the presentation. A 21-year-old patient is brought in by her sister. She is a preemie gravida and at 36 weeks, zero days by sure dates. The sister gives the history that she fitted at home. The patient has no history of epilepsy. Guys, we have a fitting patient. I need some help, please. Let's put her on a left lateral position to clear the airway. Excellent. Kofi, can you check the airway for us, please? Make sure that it is clean and also put up oxygen. 
At the same time, please apply monitors. Uh, Laratu, we need IV access. Can you put up a drip? At the same time, please take hemoglobin, platelets, urea, creatinine, AST, LDH, and a glucose. Anusha, she is eclamptic. We need magnesium sulfate. Give four grams in 200 ml saline. Follow that by five grams with lignocaine in each buttock. After the 200 ml bolus, please also give 100 ml. Good. Elise, do you have a blood pressure? What is the blood pressure? 240 over 120. 240 over 120. Anusha, we need labetalol. Give 20 milligrams IVI stat. Elise, we're going to need a urinary catheter. At the same time, please do a dipsticks. Right. Is she breathing all right? Okay. Hello, ma'am. Hello. The patient seems very confused. Let's start the secondary survey. 20 milligrams of labetalol given IVI. 22 plus 10 labetalol given. While Elise is inserting a catheter, I'm just assessing the patient. She's a little bit pale. Let me assess her reflexes up here. Oh, she's got very brisk reflexes. The patient has good air entry. There's no clinical sign of aspiration. She's got no hepatosplenomegaly. The uterus is soft, it's non-tender. Palpates about 2.4 kilograms and it's a vertex. Good, I hear a good fetal heart activity. On peripheral examination, she's got quite severe edema. Elise, what do you find on urine? Thanks. Sure, three plus protein urea. Okay. And the color of the urine? It seems coke colored. All right. Let's do a vaginal examination. The os is closed and posterior. Oh, guys, she's fitting again. Can we have a hand to turn on her left lateral side? Anusha, draw up another two grams of magnesium sulfate and give it IVI stat. Again, I got the results. Yes. The hemoglobin is 9.8. The platelets are 79. The LDH is 670, and the urea is 7.9, creatinine is 110. Thank you. Two grams of magnesium sulfate given IVI stat. Thank you. 25 plus 10, second dose of magnesium sulfate. Thank you. The patient seems to have responded. Lerato, will you please communicate to the patient's family? She has eclampsia, and she is very sick. We need to deliver her immediately. If you do not have facilities at your hospital or clinic to deliver the patient, she needs to be referred to your closest referral center. Okay, I hope you've all watched the video of the eclamptic patient. I know it's just a simulation, but it does give you an idea of how quick you need to act um, in a patient that is fitting and that you hold, need a whole team to help. So I want to thank our colleagues in Pretoria for making that video. So just a few basic things about an emergency situation. Remember, the, it's always the most senior person that should be the team leader. And if there isn't a clear team leader, make sure that you identify one. So either volunteer or ask if there's a more senior or more experienced person on the team. The team leader should give clear instructions and if you receive an instruction, close the feedback loop. So if somebody tells you give magnesium sulfate, you say I am giving magnesium sulfate or when you've completed the task, I have given magnesium sulfate. Okay, so now we're going to look at a specific management scenarios. So uh, we're going to look at how do we give magnesium sulfate? how to treat severe hypertension, how to assist the mother, and just a few things about the fluid balance. So magnesium sulfate is the anticonvulsant of choice. It's not uh, diazepam or valium. If somebody is pregnant and they are fitting, unless you know that they are uh, epileptic, you give them magnesium sulfate. 
So how do we give magnesium sulfate? You start with a loading dose of 14 grams. You give 400 grams in 200 ml saline over 20 minutes. So this is for eclamptic or preeclamptic patients. This is followed by 5 grams plus 1 milliliter of 2% lignocaine IMI in each buttock. So that is a total of 14 grams. The maintenance, these different regimens. So you can either give 5 grams every 4 hours intramuscularly. Um, or if you have a setup where you can carefully administer intravenous fluids and you've got IVAX or giving sets and good observations, so like uh, Tigerberg, then you can give 4 grams in 200 ml saline at 50 ml an hour and that equals to 1 gram per hour. If you can't do this safely, so if you can't give it IV safely, then rather give it intramuscularly. And remember that MagSoft is in a 50% solution, so it's one gram in every two moles. So just think about that. So five grams is a 10 milliliter solution. So it's quite a painful injection, just, just to note. So when you are in the labor ward, go have a look at the emergency trolley that you can just see what the vials look like. If you are in emergency, you know what to grab. Okay, so just there's a few words of caution on magnesium sulfate. So the therapeutic index of magnesium sulfate is very narrow, which means there's a fine line between uh, the effective dose and the toxic dose. And what happens in magnesium toxicity? It causes central nervous system suppression, and this can then lead to absent reflexes. So this is one way of, of identifying it. This is why patients on magnesium sulfate their um, reflexes should be checked every hour as part of the observations. Um, or it can lead to respiratory suppression. And this is actually how patients can die because of resp respiratory suppression. So this is why you should carefully look at the respiratory rate as well. And remember that pregnant women breathe a bit faster than non-pregnant patients. So if the respirator is less than 16, you should be concerned if there are magnesium sulfate. Then note that magnesium is excreted by the kidneys. And as you know, one of the big organ systems that can be affected by preeclampsia is the renal system. So if your kidneys are not working well and you are not excreting urine, you are not excreting the magnesium sulfate and it can build up in your circulation and lead to toxicity. This is why if the urine output is less than 100 moles in at least four hours, and this is the absolute minimum, then we stop the magnesium sulfate because this can then lead to toxicity. Um, so how do we treat magnesium toxicity? You obviously stop the magnesium sulfate you move the patient to an area where they can do close monitoring. They can monitor the sets. They can even support the respiratory system if it's necessary. So you need something like a high care unit. And you can give calcium gluconate 10%, 1 grams, IV over 10 minutes as an antidote. So every patient that um, is treated with magnesium sulfate, you need to write careful nursing instructions. You always need to write careful nursing instructions. We often neglect to do this properly, but especially in a preeclamptic patient on magnesium sulfate. So you would write hourly observations. Call the doctor if the blood pressure is severe, the pulse is high, the respiratory rate is less than 16 or more than 24. Remember that these patients can also easily get pulmonary edema. So they need to monitor the respiratory very carefully. If Call the doctor if the urine output is decreased, and we want it to be at least 30 moles an hour. So it needs to be 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour. So 60 moles an hour is the bare minimum for a patient weighing 60 kilos, and you know that most patients weigh a lot more than that. Uh, if there's absent deep tendon reflexes, in other words, the reflexes also needs to be assessed hourly, and then to prescribe 
the CTG monitoring as appropriate. So either no CTG or continuous CTG or six hourly CTG, but this is depending on the scenario and always only start CTG monitoring once the patient is stable. If the patient continues to fit or if she has another convulsion on magnesium sulfate, then you can give an additional two grams um, IV over 10 to 15 minutes. So who should receive magnesium sulfate? Any patient with severe preeclampsia, imminent eclampsia, eclampsia, or any patient that you're transferring with preeclampsia. Because the worst scenario is if a patient starts fitting on the ambulance or in the transfer. So any patients with preeclampsia, even if they have no symptoms, needs to be loaded with max sulfate prior to transfer. Okay, so this is about magnesium sulfate. So use with caution, use where appropriate, and prescribe proper instructions. So now we're going to talk about the management of hypertension. So why do we need to treat hypertension in pregnancy? If the blood pressure is more than 160 over 110, there is a risk of strokes or CVAs, and patients can die from this. The main big things that kill patients with preeclampsia is cerebral vascular accidents or pulmonary edema. So if the patient can take oral treatment, our first line is nifedipine, short acting, 10 milligrams. This is for severe hypertension. Then you need to repeat the blood pressure every 30 minutes to make sure that it actually comes down and you can repeat the dose up to four times. Uh, in Tigerberg, we will go up to three times and then we will go to parenteral treatment. It's contraindicated if a patient is tachycardic, if she's known with a cardiac lesion, or if she's unable to swallow. So if she's got a suppressed central nervous system, or if she um, is post ictal or fitting. So then you draw the treat temporarily with either labetalol or hydralazine. So labetalol, you can give um, if the blood pressure is above 160-110, the first dose would be 20 milligrams. If the blood pressure is not better in 10 minutes, and remember this will work a bit quicker than the nifedipine because it's IV, then you can give 40 milligrams. If it's still high, you can give 80 milligrams for three doses up to a maximum of 300 milligrams. Usually if we've given labetalol, it still doesn't come down. We prefer to move the patient to the high care unit where they can give a labetalol or a hydralazine infusion and monitor the blood pressure invasively with an A-line. But not everybody has those facilities available. Labetalol is a beta blocker, so it's contraindicated in patients with asthma or ischemic heart disease. Okay, now we're going to talk about the organ system evaluation. So after you've stabilized the patient, you give them magnesium sulfate, you treat the blood pressure, then you do your secondary survey. So you assess your five big five organ systems. We start with the central, or central nervous system, and they use the AVPU instead of the Glasgow Coma Scale, so that's a quick assessment. So either the patient is alert, so A, or she responds to verbal or pain, or she's unresponsive. So either A, V, P, U, um, then the cardiovascular system, look at the pulse rate, the blood pressure, is the patient shocked, is she tachycardic, is there good circulation? Then respiratory, like we said, we are looking at respiratory rate. Is she tachypneic? Are we concerned about pulmonary edema, one of the big killers in preeclampsia? Or is there respiratory suppression because of magnesium sulfate? You want to look at the saturation if it's at all possible. Make sure that it remains above 90. Then the gastrointestinal system. So look for signs of HALP syndrome, of jaundice, Hepatic tenderness, remember one of the very severe, but luckily not quite so common complication is a um, liver capsule hematoma. Um, look at the glucose level if you've I've got um, liver dysfunction. Then also look for the presence of ascites, although ascites in itself is not 
dangerous, it is a sign of severe endothelial dysfunction. And patients with ascites can very easily also develop pulmonary edema. So we also use it as an endpoint and a delivery indication in preeclamptic patients. And then the renal system, we've mentioned this before. Look at the urine output, urea, creatinine. The, the fluid management is quite tricky in a preeclamptic patient because the intravascular space is fluid depleted. Remember, they're losing the protein, the oncotic pressure is decreased, and the capillaries are leaky. So all the fluid is outside of the vessels. So they need some fluid, but the vessels are very leaky. So they can easily become overloaded. So you need to pay careful attention to that. They need catheters to assess the urine output. So, um, then the forgotten four, hematological system. So we always check the HP in the platelets. Immunological, HIV status is always important in South Africa. In pregnancy, endocrine, look at the glucose, and then musculoskeletal, look for the presence of DVTs. Pregnant patients are already at an increased risk of uh, thromboembolic events if they preeclamp because they lose their protein C and S even more so. And then only do you assess the core system. So you assess the fetus, the gestational age, and decide on fetal monitoring only if a patient is stable. So what are the basic bloods we need to do? Uh, HP platelet count, creatinine is what we usually start off with. If the platelet count is less than 100, then we will do the AST, ALT, and LDH. How do we manage the fluids? Catheterize, look at the intake and output chart carefully. Do not give more than 80 mils an hour of fluid. If the output is less than 30 mils an hour, you can give a fluid bolus of 200 mils. Um, ESMO, and remember ESMO is for the whole country, so it's also for district hospitals. They feel it's safer if it still doesn't increase, rather not to give more boluses. If you are in a facility where you can carefully monitor a patient, you can consider giving one more bolus or then to start invasive monitoring like a CVP to have a bit better idea of the fluid status. It's better to run a patient dry than to drown them. So this means basically patients will die quicker from pulmonary edema if you overload them. Honestly, we have seen patients die just because they were getting too much IV fluids in the ambulance from the facility they were transferred from. So it's safer to run a patient dry than to drown them. The capillaries are leaky. We've talked about this before. So they can easily get cerebral and especially pulmonary edema. But they are also intravascularly dehydrated. The point is, like I've said before, fluid management in a preeclamptic patient, you need to be careful with. So the stabilization is not completed until you have your lab results. And it's not appropriate to monitor the fetus prior to this. I know we do this at Tigerberg, but here at Tigerberg we have anesthetists that can give anesthetics, or general anesthetics. But ideally, you should have the platelet count. You should know that there is no help syndrome before you put on a CTG, because as soon as you put on a CTG, you have to be able to take that patient to the theater safely. And the maternal life always gets priority. So you cannot endanger a mother's life just because of uh, the fetal condition. How do we assess the fetus? So you assess for viability and viability criteria varies from facilities in, in Cape Town. So be, between us and Metro West, uh, we consider a vi fetus viable if uh, the gestational age is more than 27 weeks and the fetus is more than 800 grams. So it says for viability, arrange transfer to a place where they can manage the patient or the fetus, depending on the gestational age. Sometimes if it's pre-viable and you've confirmed preeclampsia, you'll need to consider termination of pregnancy. 
This is very important. There is no place for expectant management in district hospitals. I don't think that you can do it if you're working in Otsuren next year, just because you see the down in Tigerberg, you need to manage the patient at the correct level of care. This is what saves lives. Uh, and remember steroids if the fetus is before is premature or it's before 34 weeks. How do we refer patients? So we are at the moment on the receiving end and we don't need to do this often, but the S bar form, so S bar stands for situation, um, situation, background, assessment, recommendation. It's a very well designed form that you can use when referring a patient and it helps you to go through all, everything that you don't forget something. And then for the receiving side to actually recommend the treatment. I think the patient must become immediately. You need to give the following medication and then you can document everything very clearly and it's in duplicate in the maternity case record. So please have a look at that. Delivery. Remember, preeclampsia is a disease of pregnancy. So how do we cure it? We end the pregnancy. So this might sometimes mean that we have to terminate pre-viable pregnancies to save a mother's life. A vaginal delivery can be appropriate. They don't all need cesarean sections and you need to individualize management. And again, I'm going to say this, they need to be managed at the correct level. But it's also important to keep in mind that even after delivery, they can still get all the complications. So you're not completely out of the woods yet. They need to be monitored in a designated area until the patient is stable with good instructions. They, pre they can even sometimes get worse postpartum and they can start getting fits postpartum. So you need to control the blood pressure and you need to conti continue magnesium sulfate for 24 hours in pre severe preeclampsia or eclampsia and you need to continue antihypertensives appropriately. So you, we would change the antihypertensives postpartum. Our first line is inalapril if the renal function is normal, uh, followed by amlodipine. If they need a third agent, you need to discuss it with a specialist. Okay, so to recap, preeclampsia is a dangerous condition. It can kill mothers. Never underestimate it. Even if the patient looks fine, they can still get or already have complications. It's a disease of endothelium and it can affect many organ systems. How do you treat the patient? You stabilize, you prevent fits with MagSolf, you manage the blood pressure, you assess the organ systems, and then you make sure that the patient is treated at the appropriate level. Okay, we will um, address any questions in our Teams session and go through some more scenarios. Thank you.